Greetings. I'm Dr. Alexander Egbe, an assistant professor of medicine and pediatrics. I'll be speaking to you today about the unanticipated consequences of the Fontan operation. I have no disclosures. During this presentation, we will talk about the hemodynamic limitations of the single ventricle physiology. And next, we will review the basics of the Fontan operation. And finally, we'll end by discussing the unanticipated consequences of the Fontan operation. So what is single ventricle physiology? In a normal biventricular heart, the systemic circulation and pulmonary circulations are linked in series. As a result, pulmonary blood flow is equal to systemic blood flow and the saturation is 100%. In a single ventricle physiology, on the other hand, there is intracardiac mixing of systemic venous blood and pulmonary venous blood, resulting in obligatory right to left shunt and cyanosis. So the two primary hemodynamic limitations of the single ventricle physiology are one, ventricular volume overload, ultimately leading to ventricular failure, and cyanosis due to obligatory right to left shunt. It is because of these two problems that the Fontan operation became necessary. The Fontan operation was first performed in 1968, but described in 1971. In a nutshell, this is an operation that directly routes systemic venous return into the pulmonary circulation, bypassing the subpulmonary ventricle. This operation has undergone several modifications since the original description more than four decades ago. On the left part of the screen is the classic atriopulmonary fontan that was popular in the early 70s. On the right side of the screen is the extracardiac conduit fontan, which is the latest modification of the fontan operation. The fontan operation completely separates the pulmonary and systemic circulations, as shown in the movie. And by so doing, it overcomes the problems of the single ventricle physiology, which are cyanosis and ventricular volume overload. But it does this at a very high hemodynamic cost. It turns out that the absence of a subpulmonary ventricle in a fontan results in an obligatory high central venous pressure and low cardiac output. High CVP and low cardiac output is a definition for heart failure. So although the Fontan operation solved the problems of the single ventricle, it just created a heart failure model. This operation is just a palliation and not a cure. And we know this because we have longitudinal data showing that the survivals of these operations are faced with a lot of unanticipated consequences, which I will go over in the next few slides. The first unanticipated consequence is atrial arrhythmia. Atrial arrhythmia is present in half of all adult Fontan survivors. It is common in this population because of certain anatomic and physiologic characteristics of the Fontan circulation that predisposes to arrhythmia. These include right atrial dilation that is common in the atrial pulmonary Fontan model, atrial wall fibrosis from long-standing cyanosis, and presence of surgical scars in certain type of Fontan models. The role of direct current cardioversion for atrial arrhythmia management is well established in cardiology. And also, in patients with biventricular heart, we tend not to worry a whole lot about a small thrombus on the right side. This is because if there is a small pulmonary embolism, the right ventricle is able to mount enough systolic work to overcome the afterload. In a Fontan circulation, on the other hand, there is no subpulmonary ventricle. So 
even a small pulmonary embolism can result in a catastrophic and disastrous hemodynamic consequence. On the screen is a still frame of a TEE of a patient with atrial pulmonary fontan connection that was referred to our cardioversion suit for DC cardioversion. And just for reference, on the top of the screen is a left atrium, and you can see the huge right atrium. And in the right atrium, you see a thrombus. Of note, this patient had a therapeutic INR of 2.8. If you go ahead and cardiovar this patient and this thrombus breaks off into the pulmonary tree, this, pa this patient can collapse and die. So because of the concern about pulmonary embolism and its downstream consequences, there is a general reluctance among congenital cardiologists to perform DC cardioversion in Fontan patients with hemodynamically stable arrhythmia. So certain question needs to be answered. One, is DC cardioversion effective? How safe is it? And what happens after DC cardioversion with regards to recurrence? To answer these questions, we reviewed outcomes of 152 DC cardioversions in 86 Fontan patients. We found out that cardioversion was effective in terminating the presenting arrhythmia in three quarters of the patients. Those patients who were on a class one or class three antiarrhythmic drug had higher success rate. There were no deaths or thromboembolic complications associated with this procedure. This is the highest safety profile ever reported in Fontan patients in the literature. And we attribute this to liberal and meticulous use of TEE guidance prior to DC cardioversion. At Mayo Clinic, we perform TEE before DC cardioversion in all Fontan patients, regardless of what the INR is. Although we've shown that this procedure is effective and safe, the outcomes of short-term follow-up was a bit disappointing with more than half of them having arrhythmia recurrence within three years. This emphasizes the importance of linking your acute management strategy to your long-term arrhythmia management strategy. So what are the options for chronic arrhythmia management in Fontans? The options are medical therapy with antiarrhythmic drug, catheter ablation, or Fontan conversion with antiarrhythmia surgery. The question is, are all these strategies equally effective? If the answer is no, then at what point should we transition from one strategy to the other? To answer this question, we reviewed outcomes of 264 adult Fontan patients with atrial arrhythmia. All patients initially received antiarrhythmic drug therapy until they had their first arrhythmia recurrence. These patients were then triaged into three different treatment pathways based on the decision of the primary cardiologist. 110 patients continued on antiarrhythmic drug therapy. 34 patients went for catheter ablation and 33 patients went for Fontan conversion with antiarrhythmia surgery and the indication was primarily for arrhythmia. On follow-up, we found that the patients who continued on medical therapy had significantly worse outcome with almost all the patients having arrhythmia recurrence within five years. However, those patients that went for Fontan conversion or ablation had significantly better outcome with a recurrence rate of 50% in five years. Another important observation from this study was that the, for the patients that went for co Fontan conversion or catheter ablation, the risk of recurrence was higher the longer you wait prior to performing these procedures. So take home point for arrhythmia management are one, always think about thrombus.
perform TE guided DC cardioversion regardless of what the INR is, especially in people with atrial pulmonary fontan. Second point is that ablation or, or anti-read bed surgery are the preferred long-term arrhythmia management strategy for, for these patients. The earlier you refer the patients for this procedure, the better the outcome. Moving on to the second unanticipated consequence, which is thromboembolism. Thromboprophylaxis in Fontan is a very tricky business because you're trying to manage to balance on one hand the high tendency to clot versus the high tendency to bleed in these patients. So certain questions still remain unanswered. One is, how common is thromboembolism? How do we prevent it? And how do we treat it when it occurs? To answer this question, we looked at outcome of 278 patients with atrial arrhythmia. Two thirds of these patients received antiplatelet therapy alone for thromboprophylaxis, while one third received anticoagulation with or without antiplatelet therapy. We found out that in this subset of patients with atrial arrhythmia, the incidence of thromboembolism was 6.5% uh, per year. Also, those patients that had thromboembolic complications were more likely to die or be hospitalized for heart failure. Also, anticoagulation with warfarin at a target INR of 2.5 was superior to aspirin with regards to prevention of thromboembolism without an increase in bleeding risk. How common is thromboembolism in this population? So we looked at all commas, nearly 400 Fontan patients. We found out that thromboembolism was present in one quarter of the patients, and some of them were on warfarin at the time of thromboembolism. So all patients were treated with warfarin. So those patients who were already on warfarin, we increased the target INR to 3.0 to 3.5. Warfarin was effective in treating all cases of thromboembolism without any need for thrombolytics or surgery. However, at the target INR of 3 to 3.5 required for therapy, there was nearly a 10% bleeding risk. Also, some of the patients who, whose anticoagulation were discontinued because of bleeding, they went on to have a second thromboembolic event. So you anticoagulate them, they bleed. You discontinue anticoagulation, the clot. So take home point for thromboembolism management in Fontaine. Thrombus is common. It's present in one quarter of adult Fontaine patients. And in the subset of patients with atrial arrhythmia, the event rate is 6.5% per year. Warfarin is effective as a prophylaxis agent, and at a target INR of 2.5, it does not increase your bleeding risk. However, you require a higher target INR of 3.0 for treatment, and that is associated with a nearly 10% bleeding risk. Finally, we will touch on liver disease. The hallmark of Fontan hemodynamics is high centrovenous pressure and low cardiac output. The liver is subjected to chronic hepatic venous congestion and altered hepatic blood flow due to low cardiac output and autoregulation within the splanchnic circulation. And over time, chronic liver disease results. Based on Mayo data, we found out that cirrhosis is present in about one quarter of all adult Fontan patients. And so far, we've identified seven cases of hepatocellular cancer in Fontan patients. Liver disease is important because survival is just 35% within five years of cirrhosis diagnosis. And also, unlike the other consequences that I've reviewed, there is no treatment for liver disease except to perform heart liver transplant, which is not a great option.
in summary, we've talked about the hemodynamic limitations of the single ventricle physiology, which are ventricular volume overload and cyanosis. The Fontan operation was invented to overcome these limitations. It is a palliation and not a cure. Patients who survived this operation are now faced with unanticipated consequences. The only way we can change the clinical landscape of this disease is to focus on understanding the pathophysiology of these consequences and devising better ways to treat them. Thank you for listening.